Hello, uh, welcome to this screencast about non-cognitive skills. We're going to be looking at um, a wide variety of factors today, including some background, educational, economic, and psychological backgrounds that influence how we think about the non-cognitive skills and how we think about the world that we're preparing our students for. We're going to look at a variety of research. We're going to look at different ways, um, some specific tactics and concepts that parents and educators can influence non-cognitive skills. We're also going to look at how our program at the Colorado Spring School is trying to have a positive impact on these important areas. I'd like to share some thinking that comes from a man named Yang Zhao. Um, he was recently the keynote speaker at the uh, Association of Colorado Independent Schools Conference. And this graphic really summarizes um, the way he views traditional 19th and 20th century schooling. Essentially, you take individual differences, multiple intelligences, cultural diversity, curiosity, passion, and creativity, and you funnel it down into employable skills so that school becomes a way that people are um, sort of machined or created um, in the likeness of a mechanized society. The quote from Einstein really summarizes Zhao's viewpoint on 19th and 20th century schooling. He offers a juxtaposition to that, and he believes that excellent schooling in this day and age is going to account for multiple differences, even encourage it, try to increase curiosity, passion, creativity, and, and create enhanced human talents, and that the economy our cities, our nation, and the world will all be benefited by these enhanced human talents. So Yang Zhao has got a great way of talking and thinking about education, and I find him quite inspirational. A term that he uses quite frequently is T-shaped people. We want to create people who are both broad and deep in their knowledge and skill base. So they can work outside of a core area, that's the breadth, but they can also dive deep and have um, a speciality that is extraordinarily useful. Now, as someone who works with children in schools, we were thinking about this T-shape quite a bit, and to use Zhao's language, does it need to be a symmetrical T? Are we, if we encourage and um, support our students who have asymmetrical T-shapes or jagged profiles, are we setting them up for success later in life? Because their ability to do something uh, well and deeply and authentically is probably going to set them up for success in a complicated economy. So T-shaped people, but remember, they can be asymmetrical in their shape. So that was an overview of Zhao's thinking. I'd like to, to give sort of reference to one of my educational heroes, which is Howard Gardner who brought us to a deeper inquiry of multiple intelligences. Before Gardner began to publish in the 70s and 80s, it's was quite common for schools to really reward only a certain type of intelligence. And we believe, I believe firmly, that these intelligences um, are real and that they can be an important way that kids interface with and contribute to the world. Here's a little bit of a deeper dive. I realize this is harder to see. but we can see the intelligences here on the center column, and here you can see some ways that they are um, drawn out, or ways that they can be given to practical application. So at the Colorado Spring School, we believe kids not only should have their human talents enhanced, they have different ways of being smart, and they have different drives. So this is a summary of some recent work by Stephen Rice, who is attempting to summarize or, or discuss in kind of concise uh, detail the human drives, the ways that people find motivation. It can be something quite biological like eating or it can be something like social status. So looking at how people are motivated differently is a way that we as educators can get people ready to do their best work. I think these this idea that not everyone is motivated by the same thing is fundamentally important to looking at the non-cognitive skills. 
This next slide comes to us from the National Association of College Admissions Counselors, or the NACAC, and I'll show you their acronym in a moment. But they have a really nice um, terminology for looking at individuals and their achievements. So they talk about rear wheel skills here, usually measurable and quantifiable. The rear wheel skills consist of things like grades, scores, titles, awards, activities. Um, college admission counselors rely on these things to get an accurate sense of what students are capable of achieving in college, but there's far more to it than that. We can see here that college admission counselors are revealing how much weight they put on these particular areas, grades in college prep being preeminent, um, preeminently important in considering how to evaluate students. You can see some things that we've thought of as very, very important um, counselor letter teacher recommendations and interview, they're ranked somewhat low here, but we know for a fact that they actually matter much more than that when a student is near the bubble on whether or not they'll be admitted or not admitted into a particular school. Another general trend is universities themselves are finding that the emotional health of incoming students is at a, a low point, in fact the lowest point that in recent memory or during their research projects. UCLA did a project where they looked at 153,000 students and noted that one in 10 students um, indicated that they were frequently depressed. So depression and anxiety, as we see here in a study from the National Survey of the American College Health Association, are rising uh, amongst students entering university. So we see the rear wheel skills are not an adequate way to think about a child's ability to have success as they make a transition from high school to college or to prepare for success even in elementary school or middle school. Part of this anxiety and depression could actually be related to the economy. There's a research project that recently was concluded that showed millennials face higher university tuition, higher debt, and stiffer competition in the workplace after they graduate. So we see some of this anxiety and depression could be related to the actual environment that these young people are getting ready to navigate. To that end, the, the NACAC concept of front wheel skills is pretty important. When these college admissions counselors are looking at young people, the rear wheel, the quantifiable, doesn't always present an accurate picture of whether or not that young person is going to be able to thrive both in university and in a complicated and competitive postgraduate world. So these factors, initiative, communication, leadership, willingness to be led, collaborative skills, personal energy, all these become part of the picture. Again, relating to my topic today because these are the non-cognitive skills. So, how can these be fostered and encouraged in our young people to set them up for success, both in avoiding anxiety and depression, but also flourishing and thriving in a complicated educational and economic climate? All of this brings me to my task, which is, what does the research say? Now, the reason I titled my talk The Marshmallow Test is it relates to a famous study begun by Walter Michel. In the 1960s, he designed a research project in which children were given a choice, and they had multiple choices in case they didn't like the taste of the particular treat that was on offer, where they could double the reward if they would wait alone in the presence of the treat for up to 20 minutes. 30 years later, Michelle and his team checked back with these preschoolers and found that those who had waited for the second marshmallow generally fared better in life. And they used a fairly wide spectrum of definitions to talk about what faring better in life meant. It could have been higher scores on the SAT, or it could be something like a lower body mass index. He generally concluded that the ability to delay gratification was something that set kids up for success um, throughout their childhood and educational experiences and later in life. Now, there's been a lot of critique of this very intriguing and, and really, in general, very well done research project. 
One of which is that his sample sizes were very small and homogeneous, and it's far too small to support sweeping scientific conclusions. The second critique I find pretty interesting, which is that the marshmallow test doesn't actually measure um, some of the things that it might be claiming to measure or might be presumed to have measured. What it might actually be measuring is trust and authority or compliance as opposed to sort of stick to or grit or resilience or any of these terms that are trending um, in the conversations about non-cognitive skills today. So I throw out the marshmallow test as really sort of our entry point into some of the really interesting research that's being done on the subject of non-cognitive skills today. Paul Tuff, um, isn't it great that someone who's writing a book about grit and resilience has the last name Tuff? Paul Tuff has written um, very extensively and very persuasively about um, educational researchers and educational practitioners who are concerned with grit. A summary of his uh, most salient point is some people on the left believe that in the cognitive hypothesis that believes IQ is the most important thing about a person and that schools do best when they encourage the type of thinking that, det that detects patterns and shows up well on an intelligence test, encourage that as early as possible. The other school of thought is a character hypothesis, and we'll see some proponents of that in a moment, that believes persistence, self-control, a la the marshmallow test, curiosity, conscientiousness, and grit are the most important factors, and that they can even outdo intelligence. So I'll show you more about that in a moment. One of the researchers who's studying us the most, and I realize this is hard to see, is Angela Duckworth out of UPenn. Um, she is sort of a devotee of Carol Dweck, who I'll mention in a moment. But Duckworth has been looking at grit and trying to measure individuals' um, scores on a grittiness scale. So she has a grit inventory that I can share with you. Her findings is, her findings were, excuse me, that resilience is far more important than intelligence when it comes to particular tasks. Obviously, this provokes the question, if resilience and grit are so important, how can they be encouraged? One of the seminal thinkers here is Carol Dweck in her book Mindset, who showed two particular ways of viewing the world and much of the research um, looking into mindset and looking into non-cognitive skills sort of uses Dweck as a jumping off point. What Dweck found is there are people who tend to have a fixed mindset. Many, many adults tend to have a fixed mindset, by the way. And there is another mentality called a growth mindset. And if you can develop a growth mindset, and individuals who have a growth mindset tend to respond better, regardless of their intelligence, when faced with difficult challenges. Now the way that you view the world is the fundamental difference here. If you believe that effort will not make a difference and you either have innate intelligence or you don't, then you have a fixed mindset. If you believe that intelligence can be developed almost like uh, um, an athletic skill can be learned and developed or muscle mass or aerobic capacity can be developed, you can respond more effectively to not just intellectual challenges, but challenges in general. The fixed mindset tends to develop a helpless way of looking at the world. People can engage in negative self-talk. They can underrepresent past successes and overrepresent failures. So they're seeing the world in a skewed manner. If they attribute their failures both to themselves and in a stable way, which they believe that they always do things wrong because of some fundamental flaw, they're really showing that they have a fixed mindset. On the flip side, the growth mindset can try out new ways of doing things, engages in positive, motivating self-talk, uh, including the harder it gets, the harder I try. So even po the, the power of words is particularly important here when looking at fixed and growth mindsets. Let me give you an example of this. There's a great research project coming out of the University of Chicago that actually showed that parents can give their children math anxiety, but only if the parents help them with their homework. So this is not at all 
nature. This is nurture. So the way that we talk to our children about math in particular can influence the way that the children feel about the subject. Makes perfect sense, but the research backs it up. Dweck gives concrete examples of how to encourage children. And here at the Colorado Spring School, we've consciously tried uh, school-wide to think about the ways that we're praising. So praising effort is tremendously important. Giving kids permission to fail or permission to think of their capacities in a fixed way is not valuable for students. Now this slide I find particularly important. Wiener and Seligman have done inquiry looking at the locus of control. So when a person attributes success or failure to external factors, that can be often linked to pessimism because external factors are difficult to control. So we can say, this was just far too difficult, or those who succeeded at it were lucky. When we in attribute success or failure to internal factors, the locus of control is something that we can adapt or, or evolve in the future, and this tends to lead towards optimism. I, I have ability or I can change my effort. Very important statements about the locus of control that affects mindset, and they really can be more important than a student's intelligence when they're facing difficult tasks. Now, how does this affect us at CSS? Well, educational researchers have looked for three things that are needed for learning. The first of which is attention. If someone is not paying attention, it's very difficult for them to learn anything. At CSS, we believe that we can enhance students' attention by creating connections with teachers, peers, and the task at hand. So attention is primary to our work with students. Memory, encoding or retrieval, we can have problems on both ends of that equation, is enhanced when you follow research-based teaching practices. So the work that we do at CSS has an eye towards um, cutting-edge research practice related to how kids learn and how kids recall. Now the last part here is motivation, and I think a school like ours is ideally situated to have a positive impact on student motivation. We find that relevance to real work is a great way to get students to care. So the, the least uh, useful and esoteric skills are the ones um, that are difficult to remember. So we think that having relevance to the real world is tremendously important. Now. This wonderful slide uh, is an example of the types of thinking and the types of capacities we're trying to develop in our seminar program. So this actually comes from a whiteboard in the office of Eric Gaylord, who's our academic dean. And we can see that we're working on, working from kindergarten to the upper grade levels, and here's a digitized version of it, we're looking at ways we can enhance our students' um, capacity to do and think certain things. So again, relevant material showing them essentially a larger self in a larger world is a huge goal of our seminar programs from fall adventures, uh, Colorado expeditions, middle school seminars, and of course culminating in our experience-centered seminars. So this is a draft, a work in progress, but it really shows we believe these trips are fundamental to the way kids develop their non-cognitive skills. Related to the idea of seminars enhancing non-cognitive skills, I wanted to share this research that fascinates me from World War II. This first came to my attention from a book by Malcolm Gladwell, and he's talking about J.T. McCurdy in a book called The Structure of Morale, who looked at the psychological responses to the bombing of London. So obviously it was Adolf Hitler's goal to destroy the morale of the British people by sending the air raids over London. When McCurdy looked deeply and interviewed people, he found there were really three categories. Obviously the fatalities who lost their lives in the war. There were those who were very near to the epicenter of the bombing, who either lost loved ones or suffered mightily in the violence and these people were deeply, deeply traumatized. He called this category near misses. The near misses accounted for about 1% of the Londoners. The remote misses found their experiences empowering. 
They were no longer afraid of their reactions to new events, and they actually felt that they had overcome a crucible. They were tremendously concerned with their psychological ability to withstand the stress of being under fire. And when they felt that they had come through this crucible positively, rather than having their morale destroyed, as Adolf Hitler was attempting to do, what they found was they were of a morale that they had never experienced before. They had gone through their worst nightmare and felt they were worthy of the test. Now again, I don't at all mean to trivialize the warfare uh, part of this story, but what I have found in experiential education is that many times our students are quite concerned about some of our test events, the crucible events in their lives. And at the Colorado Springs School, we find that the crucibles that are part of our curriculum actually can inoculate kids against anxiety and depression because what they find that they they have risen to the test and they find that they have met the challenge. And because we know kids are motivated differently and have different intelligences and see the world differently, a crucible can be very different for one kid than for the kid next to them. So our program with a wide variety of crucible events which can test kids um, can have a really positive effect on kids' morale. Because what they can find is I have learned something about myself that I could have only learned if I did something beyond my previously inhabited world. I'd like to say a thing or two about stress. Now we know that the amygdala is important in triggering memory. So memory consolidation can happen when the amygdala is activated. So emotional arousal and stress hormones can have a really positive effect on memory. But we also know that there's a curve. We have strong performance when we're at a, essentially a medium part of the emotional arousal spectrum. Optimal performance when we're in an optimal state of stress, if you will. And we know that impaired performance because of anxiety can absolutely create terrible memories and, and diminished performance. So it's our job as educators to introduce children into crucibles, but be highly attuned to that child's stress and reaction and try to keep them in a place where what we're learning is a, is a positive take home. But what the child is actually coming away with is exactly as we anticipate, something that's going to increase their morale, if I can use McCurdy's term. Now at the Colorado Spring School, we think having a wide variety of differentiated curricula and relevant work helps us with this. So these are our capacities from the digital portfolio, and this really guides our work. So looking at different crucibles, different tasks, to make sure that we're not only hitting multiple intelligences, but multiple motivations, um, and finding crucibles that are appropriate for our kids. So I think looking at the spectrum of task and thought here in context of non-cognitive skills is really important. So this is really one of my last slides and I want to give a summary. So we know that non-cognitive research shows us that internal unstable and controllable locations or attributions of locations is pretty important with how kids think about their capacities. Having kids feel that they are in control of something that is changeable is a way to create optimism in them. Similarly, we're committed to praising effort and not ability. We believe that kids can be inoculated against anxiety by achieving developmentally appropriate successes as part of a curriculum. We also believe kids will be motivated to the highest extent when they find their work relevant, not only to others, but to their future self. And we believe there's a sweet spot in which kids can be engaged with themselves, with others, and with material. And we believe our experiential education program helps us find that sweet spot. Thanks so much for listening. What follows here is a list of some of the research which guided this presentation.